Good morning, Mount Olive. For all you dads out there, happy Father's Day. I want to thank you for everything that you do for your families and for the youth here at church. Our Lima team, I looked up and Jeff Riddle was walking in the door. And I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I thought he left. Put it up high. Then it, okay. Anyway, now I sound really loud. Anyway, so they're back and they went through some difficulties. So I will get them. A, uh, presentation from them but just know that those guys have been through it in their travel this week but they got there they accomplished their mission and they did it through commitment and that's um, also goes along with our fathers Day. we want to thank you for that our haiti team's going to be coming back on tuesday and the porta Maldonado team is going to be coming back on sunday so keep them in prayers especially for travel because it seems to be the most difficult part so far this year so welcome this morning and i want to thank the praise team for ushering us into the presence of the Lord. Good morning, Mount Olives folks and fathers and dads. Hey, would you stand with us? I want to read some scripture. And uh, then this is going to lead us into worship. This is going to set the pace for the other songs. Our opening song is a song written by Chris Tomlin and Jason Ingram called Psalm 100. And everybody goes, oh, that's cool. It's a song. But yeah, it's a song of a song of a psalm. So this is Psalm 100 from God's Holy Word. <clears throat> and it also says that this is a psalm for giving thanks. So we all need to think about what we're thankful for. Even though it's Father's Day and we thank you for fathers and we thank you for a heavenly father. The psalmist writes, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <coughs> Through the gates 
for the Lord is good and His love endures. His love endures forevermore. His faithfulness it has no end. For the Lord is good and His love endures. His love endures. Consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Psalms 8, 3, verses 3 through 4. What is 
worship father god i just pray over the whole service let your holy spirit fall down and let us trust in you knowing that you are with us and that you have a hold of us in your hands and it's in your name i pray amen
you know what tomorrow brings There's not a day ahead you have not seen So in all things be my life and breath I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less When you don't move the mountains, I need you to move When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you Trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not Thank you, praise team. Great job. Wonderful job. Oh, did that first service too. Uh, I have a short video I want to show for Father's Day. Uh, so if we could go ahead and play that, that'd be great. Hi, 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 hi. Mug is mine, it's something I got for doing things that mom cannot. Like throwing you into the pool, even when the signs say it's not cool. And I pulled my back yesterday, trying to move the giant chest. And now I'm on my back all day. I thought you'd be impressed, cause I'm your dad. dad. Your dad, you know it. Cause I'm your dad. You're dead, come on, because I'm your dad, you're dead, you know it. And you know I'm gonna injure myself just to show you once again who's dead. Oh. Oh. Ow! Oh, it's my hammy. I'd rather drive to the wrong address and then take advice. From GPS, uh, when I say I'm playing with my son, I'm spacing now on Xbox One. But when I drop you all at the carpool, yeah, yeah, bye, sweetie, yeah, and I embarrass you. I left these hot dogs out last night, but I'm not afraid but to take a bite. Yeah. And you can't fit your LaCroix in here Cause it's filled with IPAs It's a special seasonal release So I had to buy a case Cause I'm your dad, dad your dad, dad You know it, yeah. Cause I'm your dad, dad your dad, dad Come on, baby, dad. Dad. Cause I'm your dad, dad your dad You know baby, it, you dad. know And I love you more than anything So you tell me once again Who's dad? Hi, hi, hi. All right. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, and happy Father's Day to those of you who 
may not be biological fathers, but have been fathers to so many in this congregation, in this community. Thank you for everything you do. We have a gift for you today. If you haven't picked it up on your way in, make sure you pick one up on your way out. For all men in here today, we have a flashlight. Yeah, I will be using mine during the service. If I see you sleeping, I'm going to put it on you, <laughs> wake you up, get your attention. Uh, do we have any fathers in here who became fathers this year? Recent fathers. Do we have any recent fathers? Or you're expecting? Well, my brother's not here, but if he was, he could stand. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right, do we have any people that became grandfathers this year? If you became a grandfather or going to be becoming a grandfather this year, stand up. Yeah. All right, do we have any great-grandfathers? Any great-grandfathers? I know we got to cut. There's one. All right, so if you're just a father in general, I'd like you to stand up so we can give you a, a round of applause. Thank you for, thank you for everything you, you do. Uh, thank you. One of the greatest privileges of growing up here was growing up in a church where I had uh, men speak into my life, uh, godly, wise men. And I appreciate every one of you, and I thank you for what you do, not only for me, but for this congregation. If we can have our ushers come forward. I'm just bringing help along because she's going to come anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and as they do, let's pray. Dear Lane, gracious Father, I thank you for the gift that you have given us of our earthly fathers, the ones that have shown us an example of you, how you love us, how you take care of us. Uh, Lord, even when you do things to impress us, <laughs> And uh, they, they've just been there for us all throughout. They've let us see what you are like. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. These tithes and these offerings, we give back a small portion to expand your kingdom, uh, to let others know about how good you are. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mary. So there are two worst case scenarios on a Sunday morning. One, the power goes out. Two, you don't have enough offering plates. Those are two bad emergency situations. Thank you guys for figuring that out so quickly uh, on the move this morning. If you thought I was joking about the flashlight, I'm not. So I'm going to be looking around. Sure you're, 
sure you're awake. I want to take a quick minute and uh, just say, I just want to, I just want to say a prayer. Uh, we have some things going on in our congregation. I feel like uh, the devil's kind of beating us up a little bit. And I just want to take a moment to pray, uh, to ask the Holy Spirit to come down. Uh, so let us pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are power. And Lord, there's some things going on in the lives of the people in this congregation that are, uh, that are beating them down. Situations have pummeled them, Lord. And right now we just ask that we're going to bind the devil and we're going to cast him out of this, these situations and out of this building and out of the lives of the people in this community. By the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, we claim it. And Lord, we ask that your spirit would come down, that it would wash over these situations, that it would wash over this community, that your power would be evident in the circumstances that are happening. Lord, you are a great God. And we will serve you to the end. We ask all this in the holy, powerful, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> so, we're going to be talking about failure today. Uh, do you ever feel like a failure? Yeah. Like, probably by the end of the day, I'll feel like a failure. Oh, <laughs> children's church. That just failed that. Children's church, at least the children to children's church. <laughs> yeah, failure. We've all, we're all failures. We've all had points in our life, like I said, probably me yesterday, like every day. Uh, and I know you're thinking, May, well, that's an interesting way to start a sermon, to call everybody a failure. <laughs> but trust me, we're going somewhere with this. I have a slide, I want to, a video I want to show you next, and they said it was fixed for this service. Yeah. Yeah. That is failure. <laughs> failure to prepare, failure to check your equipment before you do something like that. Uh, but that is failure. And one of the biggest struggles in my life is handling the expectations that I put on myself and the expectations that I allow others to put on me. And I would think that I'm probably not alone in this, that almost, actually probably every one of us, struggle with expectations in our life. Whether we've put them on ourselves or whether someone else has, we struggle with expectations. The beginning of the school year was always a really fun time for me growing up. And it was for only one reason. Anybody know what that is? No? School supplies. I think I might have heard it. School supplies. There's just something magical about the smell of brand new paper. <laughs> it is. Holding a spiral notebook that hasn't been written in yet. Sharpening a brand new pencil. I know they have all the mechanical pencils now, but there's something magical about actually sharpening a pencil. A, a brand new highlighter the first time you take it out and you use it. It's like as crisp and yellow as, as any yellow you've ever seen in your life. There's something magical about it. And I think it's the newness that I loved about that time of year. New school supplies were like a blank slate in life. It didn't matter what you ended up with grade last year. It didn't matter the relationships you had with your teacher. It didn't matter the study habits you had the year before. It was a brand new slate. You can say, this semester, I will achieve and win. And for some of us, we could say that. We just didn't do it later. But we can say that at the beginning. It's a blank slate. And that's what I loved about it. But expectations are difficult. We or someone else expects something out of us, and that opens the door for potential failure. And just the word failure or fail. Like, I don't even like to say the word fail. It's like... Like, it doesn't taste good coming out of your mouth. But I want to take a look at a couple famous failures. Anybody know who these people are? 
See, some of you said the first service, they all knew it, but that didn't <laughs> shock me. For those of you born in the 2000s, this is the Beatles. You probably still know who they are, but this is the Beatles. And when they first began as a band, the Beatles were told, we don't like your sound. We don't like your sound. And they were also told, and guitar music is on the out anyhow. Yeah, and we all know how that turned out for them. They took over the world for, for a while. Uh, but they were failures at the beginning and successful later on. You know who this is? No, it's, it's not me in the morning. This is, this is Albert Einstein. He, uh, Albert Einstein couldn't speak well when he was younger. In fact, so much so that his parents decided that he was mentally challenged. And so he spent the early part of his life being put in the programs and being treated the way uh, they treated those people back then. It was, wasn't good. But we later come to find out, he, obviously, there was nothing wrong with this man. He's a genius. Like, and he figured it out. But they looked at him as a failure young, and he was successful later. All right, so this is a good one. Does it, do any of you guys in the pew back there, my youth pew, know who this is? No. That, I, yeah, it's Disney. It's Walt. This is Walt Disney. The, it was an actual man, not just a theme park. His name was actually <laughs> Walt Disney. Uh, I, asked, I told First Service, I was like, I'd be interested to know if they actually knew who this was. Walt Disney uh, went bankrupt four times before finding success. And along the way, he was told he lacked imagination and he had no good ideas. <laughs> yeah. And we know how that turned out for him. Uh, I think his imagination was perfect and fine. And, and he went on to be very successful. I mean, who this is? Charles Schultz. Yeah, the, Charlie Brown should have given it away. He was the creator of the Peanuts comic strip. And he had every cartoon he'd submitted rejected for publication by his high school yearbook when he was in high school. He was drawing back then, and he gave them to his high school, and they rejected all of them. They wouldn't put any of them in the yearbook. In fact, later on, he was rejected for a position at Disney, which is funny. He just did Walt. But he was rejected. But later on, we know the story of Charles Schultz. He's everywhere. Everybody knows who this man is. Everybody knows who Charlie Brown is. There are movies. There are stuffed animals. There are cartoons. He was considered a failure early. Later on, became successful. All of these people reached a point in their lives and careers where they could look back and say, yeah, that's what people thought of me, but I showed them. I showed them. In the Bible, we're going to be talking about a prophet today. And a prophet is someone God authorizes to be his messenger. And this prophet we're going to be talking about was probably between the ages of 17 and 20 when he began his ministry. So a very young prophet. And a lot of times when we think of prophet in the Bible, we think of something like this. Long, gray, white beard, wrinkles, a little older, maybe balding. We think of an old man, which isn't necessarily a fair stereotype to put on all prophets in the Bible. We're going to be talking about Jeremiah today. Jeremiah was in his late teens. He may not even be able to grow a beard at this point in his life when he started his ministry as a prophet. He, like these people mentioned before, were a failure by world standards. Jeremiah was considered a failure in world standards. The only difference is that unlike those people mentioned before, Jeremiah never achieved worldly success. Never. Not like Walt, not like Charles, not like Albert, not like the Beatles. He never attained worldly success. When I read the Bible, I always secretly hoped that we could know more about the different people's emotions in the stories of the Bible, like David and Goliath. I would love to know a little bit more about the emotions and the feelings that were running through, not just David, but his brothers and his family. And, and there are countless stories in the gospel where I wish we just had a little bit more of a, an emotional portrait of what Andrew and James and John and Peter and these people were going through. I always wished there was just a little, I mean, the book would probably be a lot longer and be like stacked up to here, but I just wish it was there. The cool thing about reading the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations is that we know exactly who Jeremiah is emotionally. He is what I like to call a ball of emotions. I don't know if you've read Lamentations, 
But it is, give it a shot sometimes if you really want to see all about Jeremiah. I'm going to read to you Jeremiah, and you can turn your Bibles there if you'd like to. I'm not bring my... didn't. Jeremiah, chapter 20. If you'd like to turn there. Verses 14 through 18. And this is just going to give you a little bit of peek into the emotional package that is Jeremiah in both his books. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew, without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon. For he did not kill me in the womb, with my mother as my grave. Her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? That's just a little taste of what he wrote in his two books. He was a ball of emotions. But what I love about this is that we can be balls of emotions too, right? Most of us have gone through parts of our life where we may have felt like this. And he's, it's, it's so refreshing to see this real story in the Bible. That's why I love Jeremiah. We live in a culture that we don't see real enough. You have apps. You can take a picture of yourself and you can make yourself look like anything you want to. You can give yourself more hair, or less hair. You can give yourself different colored hair, different colored eyes. You can change your complexion. We live in a culture we so very rarely see real. It's one of the reasons why I love Jeremiah. He is real. In all his struggles, in his shortcomings, in his strengths, we know who he is. And we're going to be looking at him and talking about expectations. Expectations are very real. They are very real. They are everywhere. They are part of our life. There will be expectations, whether they come from us or someone else. And Jeremiah had a bunch on him. His expect, expectations of himself, other people's expectations of him, and God's expectations on him. If you were in your late teens, early 20s, in 626 B.C., you'd probably have uh, been focusing on living a traditional life, which kind of would go like this. Become an apprentice, secure a job, acquire housing, get married, spend time with friends, and after a while, die. Like, hooray for life. That would have been what, that's a traditional life. However, we probably have similar expectations for ourselves now. Learn a skill, go to college, get a job, move out of town, get married, have kids, spend time with friends, and after a while, we die, right? Like, that's kind of the path there's a beginning and an end. We're born and then we die. It, it's kind of morbid to think about life in those terms, but I, I use that to draw our attention to the similarities between our lives now and the lives of Jeremiah. And we all generally flow in this life cycle. And the thing is, we red flag people when someone deviates from that path. We expect people to keep up with a status quo life. And it wasn't much different in Jeremiah's day. People expected him to live a normal life. But God had very different expectations for Jeremiah. I used to enjoy watching this show. Not all the time. I, didn't, I was an avid watcher of this show. But I, I used to watch it a little bit. It intrigued me to watch people come up with the business plans. Like, and then administer those plans to their completion. It was always fun to see like what they were going to use, what kind of advertising, like themselves, are they going to put on billboards? Like, I always enjoyed that part of it. I also think Donald Trump's hair is both ridiculous and fun to watch, and that's why I watched <laughs> that show, because you never knew how it was going to move. It had a mind of its own. Uh, and if it was windy outside, it was even better. It was like a kite connected to his head. Uh, Donald and his team would give very clear expectations for the kook two competing teams at the beginning of each episode. And the team that lost each challenge had to go to the boardroom where now President Trump would have to say the, those famous words, you're fired. Now, I can't do the, you know, the, like, you're fired, however he does it, but you're fired. And that's the problem with expectations in our life. 
sometimes we fail. Sometimes we think we're doing really well and we just miss the mark. You know, we give it 110% A-level work, you know, right on, and we still fail. Sometimes we hear you're fired. Thankfully, we serve a God with heavenly expectations that are different than anything we're used to here on earth. He does have expectations for us. God has expectations for everybody as his followers, but they are very different than ours or other people's expectations from us. They're very different. The world expects success. God expects faithfulness. Remember, Jeremiah was one of God's prophets, and he wasn't very much older than some of you guys sitting back there. He had to go share God's message with a pretty harsh group of people. And it would be hard enough to be called to be an outspoken messenger of God to a really lost group of people, but God told Jeremiah something that made it even harder. God knew how messed up the situation was getting ready to become with Israel. He knew the situation that was going to happen, that they were going to get ransacked, that they were going to get taken over. So God forbade him from marrying or having children. And because of this, his family and his friends turned their back on him. Now, if you have a child, if you've had a child, uh, I can't imagine not having them. Like, that would be difficult. That would be difficult for any of us sitting here today if God came to you and said, I forbade you from getting married or having children. And that's what he asked Jeremiah to do. I think of Jeremiah's life as a weird version of solitary confinement. Like, because he really didn't have a whole lot of friends. Well, he didn't have any friends. Uh, he, his family had kind of turned on him. Sure, he interacted with people, but he had no true relationships with family or friends. And most of the people he spoke with didn't even want him around. Like, they didn't want to hear him speak. He was isolated and alone. He also truly believed in God and the calling to proclaim God's message to others. So besides being alone, imagine this. He was also heartbroken because he was giving the message of God and the people of God were rejecting it. So he was alone and heartbroken. He saw himself as a failure. Jeremiah was given a nickname. Does anybody know what Jeremiah's nickname was? Weeping yeah, the weeping prophet. Uh, and with good reason. He was overwhelmed with sadness. If you have any doubt about this, just check out the books of Jeremiah and Lamentations, uh, and you'll get a clear picture of this guy's life. The pe people of Israel had become so hardened by the numbing effects of sin that they no longer believed God. And worse still, they no longer feared God. The same people of God who had heard the stories of what our God had done, delivering his people for like, like we, all these stories, and they lost their fear for God. Jeremiah preached for 40 years, and not once did he see any real success. Not once. Think about how that must have felt. Zero earthly success Zero positive human relationships. Zero, zero, zero. The other prophets we read about in the Old Testament at least encountered some success at some point in their ministry. And imagine that you're all alone doing a very unpopular job and you never succeed. Motivated are you at that point? When I was a kid, I remember reading this book, and some of you probably do too. Uh, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. And it was about a little boy and all the issues he has on a random, miserable day. And we've been there. We've all been there. A botched project at work, forgotten your homework, you and your friend getting a fight. You've had, we've had bad days. Uh, growing, growing up, I was kind of taught through culture that if you kept trying hard enough, eventually you'll make progress and see some signs of success and happiness. The problem is, that's not necessarily true. We're called to work hard for the Lord. But if you look at scriptures, we're never promised wealth or success as a result on this earth. Seriously, read the Bible. It's, it's not in there. You're not going to find a place that guarantees us worldly success and wealth. 
for following God's plan for our life. Instead, we're told in the Bible to work hard and keep doing what God has asked of you. Here are some verses I have I want to read for you. Get them open. First one comes from 1 Corinthians, and it says, So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And then in Colossians, it says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. And Ephesians 6 says, Save wholeheartedly as if you were, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. None of those verses say, do what you want. None of those verses say, give up doing what you should if it's inconvenient. No. They say that whenever and wherever you are doing anything, we should do it like we are doing it for God. I don't know about you, but that certainly changes my attitude towards letting somebody over on a busy interstate on my way to the beach. It draws our attention to the things that we need to pay attention to, those small moments. This is not my strong suit. I want to succeed. I want to win. I want to be the best. I hate losing. You can ask my youth. I don't like losing. Like when we play Death Hack, it was one of the games we play, I legit try to win. I'm not going to let them win. I legit try to win. So it's not my strong suit. I hate losing. And Jeremiah struggled with this too. Jeremiah actually gets to a breaking point, and that's the scripture I read you earlier. He said, curse the man who went out and told my father that he had a son. He's like, I wish they would have killed me. He reached this breaking point. Now, does this guy sound like someone who is handling the failure and disappointment in their life very well? No, not in this particular set of scriptures. He doesn't seem to be handling it very well. But as a follower of Jesus, we have somehow started thinking that God's way for life is easy. And I'm going to tell you guys, it's usually not. It is usually not. It's hard and frustrating to keep feeling like you're failing. But we have to keep remembering God doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. He doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. And do you know what that does, especially in this culture? That encompasses all humanity. We no longer look at people for what they wear, what they drive, where they live, their bank account. Because our God doesn't say that makes you successful. He's not calling you to be successful. He's calling you to be faithful. And every one of us in here, regardless of what position we're in right now, can be faithful. Anybody, anywhere, anytime. Faithfulness and obedience go hand in hand. We cannot sit back and handpick times and situations when we're going to be faithful to God. We have to obey him every day. And that is so hard. We all know, I know, that is so hard. In the very beginning of the book of Jeremiah, God reassures the prophet. And let's take a look at God's word. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And God is saying the same thing to us. I made you. I know you. And I have set you apart for a specific purpose. I tell my young people all the time, you are here right now on this earth today during this time for a purpose. There is a reason God put you here. You may not know it yet, but I'm telling you there is a purpose. God doesn't make accidents. He didn't accidentally put you here. You're here for a purpose. Purpose. And if God created us and set us apart, we should be obedient to him. Now, obedience is a gross word. I'm not going to lie. It's one of those words like we obey traffic laws. Sometimes we obey traffic laws. We send our dog to obedience school. We tell our children to obey their parents. In America, the word obedience kind of sounds like something that we're forced to do. Like, yeah, I have to obey this stuff. I have to go 45. 
I'm, I go 50, but I, I, you're supposed to go 45. However, we choose to be obedient to the people we follow. If your best friend or maybe your favorite musician started doing their hair different or dressing different, what happens? A lot of times you begin to see yourself go that way. I mean, I work with young people, so I see the culture shifts in the, in the form of dress and music and hair, and you can see it. Even in our younger kids, you can see like the second and third graders, you begin to see what that fashion and sense is going to look like when they get to be in high school. We choose some things to obey. And think of it another way. Think of it like this. If you see a two-year-old, two-year-old in a store and they get separated from their parent for just like a half second, like mom walks around the edge of the aisle and the kid's still looking at the sugary cereals, like a half a second, what does the kid do? Yeah, he like loses it. Like the bottom lip pops out, you know, and all of a sudden tears start flowing and we just hear this scream for mommy. Like we hear that. In the store. If you're following Jesus, obedience to Him will not feel like something that you're forced to do, but instead something we get to do. We need to stop looking at obedience as this bad word, that it's something I'm forced to do, and begin to look at the side of obedience where we get to be obedient to a God who knows our purpose and knows every step. Let's get real practical with this. We need to weekly, daily, hourly, even minute by minute, Choose the direction that would honor God. And that's difficult to do. But we need to choose to do that. Even in the small things, like I said, letting somebody over on interstate on the way to the beach because it gets bad going down to the beach. C.S. Lewis once said this about obedience. To have faith in Christ means, of course, trying to do all that he says. There would be no sense in saying you trusted a person if you would not take his advice. Thus, if you have really handed yourself over to him, it must follow that you are trying to obey him. Failing is painful. Expectations are hard. But regardless of what circumstance you are in, as followers of God, we're called to be faithful and obedient to him. In the book of Lamentations, which we believe the prophet Jeremiah wrote, we can read about what was going on during the destruction of Jerusalem. This was a bad time in the history of Jerusalem. We talked earlier about Jeremiah seeing no success in his ministry. And at this point, Jeremiah is close to the end of his life. He's seen mass devastation and death. He has seen starving children, people stopping the worship of God, hungry mothers literally eating their children. Jeremiah is probably at the lowest point of his life. In the brief book of Lamentations is Jeremiah's mourning and grieving. But here's the thing. Jeremiah is surrounded by death, horror, and every failed expectation that you can imagine. His world at this moment makes me feel guilty for some of the things I get worked up about. My stress is nothing compared to Jeremiah's. Listen to the words he writes in his lament about his current situation. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. What a powerful statement of this man's life. Forty years of failure. Forty years of people looking at him saying, you are a failure. And what does he say? The faithful love of the Lord never ends. We see his life come full circle. We see this willingness to be faithful and obedient to the call God put on his life. Uh, we went to an event last night over in Mount Crawford with the youth. And the speaker there, he uh, had an object lesson he did with a $20 bill. It was really good and it kind of fit in to uh, my sermon today. So I'm going to use it. So, since I already told you what it is, what is this? $20 bill. Who wants a $20 bill? Eddie wants a $20. All right. So, Eddie, if I, uh, if I did this, do you still want it? Do you, want, uh, do you want, still want it? Is that, if, I, if I, like, sat down on it and you're like, <laughs> would you still want it? <laughs> if I balled it up, would you still want it? If I, like, kicked it around, stepped on it, something like that? Yeah, you'd still want it. Now, why would you want it? 
Because it's worth something. It has worth. It doesn't matter what happens to this thing. If I, if I made enough money to have 100, I would have 100 up here today, but I don't. I'm young and broke. So I got a 20. It has worth. And this is just like each one of us in this room today. It does not matter what you came into this building with. It doesn't matter the past mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter the past things that have been done to you. You have a worth and a purpose in the kingdom of God. Just like this 20. Each one of us. And so it speaks powerfully to how we need to be faithful and obedient to God's call. And it doesn't matter who you are doesn't. God has a purpose and you have worth. And I don't want you to ever forget that. Every time you look at a 20, make sure you remember that you're worth something and God has a purpose for your life. Father God, take this day, take this day of celebration of fathers, <clears throat> take this celebration of life. Father God, we know that in your hands, because you created us, we are not failures, we're works in progress. We overcome and we become because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and your love for us. So may we go out boldly and victoriously. May we never, never give up because Father, you always hold us and you'll be with us forever. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen.